This right here, folks, this is going to be a risky one. And I guess you can add this to my growing list of reasons Mildred is a heretic. Ah, oh, well, let's get into it. If you can make yourself more than just a man, if you devote yourself to a night, and if they can't stop you, then you become something else entirely. Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mildra, and I will be your gaming monk for the evening. So, Dungeons & Dragons 4th Edition. The Black Sheep. The Scourge of the Hobby. The time when D&D abandoned its role-playing roots and tried to be a massively multiplayer online game. Tabletop WoW, as it were. Is that really the case? No. Not quite. Surely you can't be serious. I am serious. And don't call me Shirley. Now, I'm not going to sit here and claim the game is completely without fault. That'd be utterly preposterous. There's a reason the 4th edition experiment lasted only so long. However, I do feel there's a bended degree of overhate on several aspects, often on the level of Call of Duty. And why do I say overhate? Well, it occurs to me that many critics weren't even hating the game, but hating an impression of an impression of the game a la Dana Carvey's George Bush impressions. I see this kind of thing often. A clear difference between those who criticize the idea of something and those who criticize the actual product. It's for this reason that I make the comparison to Call of Duty, because in both cases the majority of the hate is directed towards the idea of certain audiences or trends or mindsets and so on that they don't happen to approve of. And to voice that disapproval, they'll attach certain buzzwords, dude bro being the obvious one, but I'm pretty sure you can think of a few others. In this musing, I'll be going through a few of the most common criticisms and my own critique on the game itself. Before I continue, however, I need to address one trend that I noticed early on. When 4th edition first came out, it appeared that anyone defending it had to go through a rather embarrassing listing of credentials ritual to show that they weren't some noob or filthy casual. These often ended with some variant of, I know what I'm talking about. There's nothing particularly offensive about these intros. I'm just not a fan of them on principle. Nobody should have to go into such a detail about their history. That's the kind of shit I expect from Tumblr talking about preferred pronoun bullshit. Not discussion on a fantasy role-playing game. Getting that aside out of the way, let's move on. I hear this claim a lot, that it's tabletop WoW or some other permutation thereof. Personally, this claim never made a whole lot of sense to me, as I don't see anything that's in an MMO design specifically that's in this game's design. The level-based rewards and powers? Eh, maybe, if you want to stretch it. But that's the case with a dozen other games, both video and tabletop. There's no fetch quests inherently in the rule set. Any semblance of mass combat or dungeon bosses aren't going to be structured like a typical raid, so where's the MMO in this? Well, I have my own guesses. It's a bit nonsensical, but I firmly believe in the eliminate the impossible adage. An ancestor of mine maintained that if you eliminate the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. See, 4th edition came out in 2008. That same year, World of Warcraft released its second expansion, Wrath of the Lich King, and was arguably at the peak of the game's popularity. The MMO juggernaut was near ubiquitous in gaming, with countless copycats following along with it. Alas, with any trend that rises so suddenly, there's an inevitable backlash of people who think it's not that good, overrated, etc, etc. As time goes on, that backlash starts to descend in on itself. People aren't directing their vitriol to the game itself, but rather as an impression of an impression of the genre as a whole. When criticizing a genre like this, the critiques become broader and more non-specific, eventually reaching the point that the criticisms are like a jingle everyone knows the words to. If you want another example of this in the video game end of things, look at the JRPG cliché list that everybody was using in the late 2000s. I'd also be remiss if I didn't speak on the virtual tabletop concept at the initial presentation, which sadly didn't see the light of day. I don't think this was ever meant to be anything other than a virtual tabletop, akin to what Fantasy Grounds, Tabletop Simulator, and Roll20 are today. On the other hand, its appearance can lead to a guilt by association deal. While I'm not averse to critique a game I like, I think proxy criticism as mantra does no favors to an argument. But it is this broad argumentation that brings me to my second point. And this is where things are going to get a bit ugly. In a nutshell, the claim is that all of 4th edition's mechanics revolve around combat, and there is no room for role-playing one's character. This is a trickier one than the first point, because what counts as role-playing can be highly subjective. But permit me a moment to give you one unpopular truth. If you want pure role-playing mechanics, 
You're in the wrong game. LIES! THE FILTHY EARTH BOY LIES! No, seriously. D&D has always been geared around combat and similar adventuring for years. If you want something more narrative, then you should go play a narrativist game like Interlock, the D6 system, or the Storyteller Adventure system. Each of those examples are centered around storytelling through mechanics or overall design, and are meant to reward descriptive play. D&D, in my experience, has never taken that route. Excluding supplementary material, it's always had roles, there's always been the emphasis on both combat and building towards making a better combatant, and so on. Furthermore, the attempt at a skill system in D&D in the same way it's done in so many other games has been awkward at best. It was never really designed for skills the same way other games are. Ultimately, the role-playing aspect is up to the players to bring that to life. The rules are just a means to do so. I find the no role-playing claim to be wanting in terms of evidence compared to its direct predecessors. There's also the issue that D&D can't decide if it wants role-playing in a living world or if it wants to be full murder hobos. But that's a subject for another day. Disassociated mechanics is another thing that was brought up in the debate with the game. The short version is that they're mechanics that separate the player from character. I am not fond of this term for several reasons, the least of which being it sounds like the kind of story game bullshit I'd see in The Forge. First off, the term is too ill-defined. I've seen a myriad of debates about what it is, just as much as I've seen it used utmost like a form of punctuation, a la buzzword criticism that I'm not so fond of. Secondly, it's something that's so heavily skewed in favor of narrative or simulation styles of play. There's nothing wrong with either of these, but what I take issue with is putting them on a higher pedestal than other styles of play. The last thing gaming needs is yet another dick measuring contest. Third, it assumes that players are meant to be in character constantly, and that's a tall order for anyone to make, especially if you're just gaming for beer and pretzels. And finally, it's inherently contradictive for a game to not have game mechanics. And games should be about having fun, not some abstract ideological purity. From where I sit, disassociated mechanics may as well be upfront about their actual meaning when used in lexicon. Bad, wrong, fun. If that is an interpretation of it that is wrong or seeing it not in the positive light, then I'm sorry, but if you need to have that much debate about what it is and what it isn't, it tells me that at best the concept is flowery arms and embroidered legs, and at worst it is just fundamentally flawed. But moving on, I said in the beginning that I do have my own criticisms regarding 4th edition, so let's dive into that. Now I personally feel 4th edition was a net positive, but I am very aware of its faults, some more legitimate than others. To give a bit of perspective though, I should take the time to explain what I thought it did right. Defined roles. Having a clear idea of what each class is going to be good at helped newcomers get past the first hurdle, the metagame of what their particular character should be doing in a given point, and how to properly build their characters in service to that. Granted, a good GM will be able to teach them that kind of thing, or tell them, but it's a far different experience when they learn that organically on their own. This role setup was a mixed blessing, but we'll get to that in a second. Progression. Some of the design team for 4th edition had previously worked on Star Wars Saga Edition, and carried with some of their notes in the design process, namely the skill training approach and the half-level modifier applying universally. Progression is important in RPGs, and having this universal bonus was a wise move to reinforce that. The Healing Surge. If you saw my review of 5th edition, you'll know that I criticized the use of hit dice as missing the point of healing surges. When they were introduced in 4th edition, the purpose was to allow any given character some opportunities for healing, not having it be the sole job of the cleric. I saw a few arguments that it was unrealistic, but it's important to note that hit points are meant to be abstracted. They're not literal representation of health in the same level as wounds in other games. Monster Synergy My first encounter was with kobolds. Previously something that had just been the beat stick of entry-level players, the job squad of D&D. Suddenly in this version, they had an increase in depth, having subtypes and variants of them, as well as not falling into the trap of everybody uses the same stuff, help the encounters give new life. As Esper put it in one of his takes, they are simple yet complex at the same time. Feat-based multiclassing. This will likely be an unpopular pick on my part, but I like the power swap feats used here. More often than not, people multiclass because they want to get a specific ability that their class just doesn't have. The feed approach is still a trade-off, yes, but I feel it cut out the middleman and dodged the problem of multiclass characters being overcomplicated, suffering from mad syndrome, or just underpowered. There's a handful of other things I enjoyed. 
but many of these are just little things tied to these pillars directly or indirectly. Be they the psychic points introduced later, the increased importance of races with their own abilities, an attempt to give feats some proper focus in what they're supposed to do as a universal thing, and the creation of the martial power source, which caused as much salt as did Tome of Battle back in 3rd edition. However, I won't pretend that the game was perfect. The potential varieties regarding character creation were very limited early on, with the first player's handbook only having 8 classes as opposed to 11 in 3rd and 9 in advanced 2nd. Furthermore, I think the change away from the massive spell sheets into the level by level progression created the MMO impression in the minds of many. Not helped that several staple classes were missing from the main book. In addition, there was the emphasis on map play, which has certainly always been there, but the abstraction wasn't as present as in previous editions. The intent, it seems, with 3rd edition's balance was to be over a whole campaign rather than a given moment. Unfortunately, various exploits and spell usage snapped that balance in a billion pieces. Because of that, 4th edition was trying to do a balanced synergy at any given level, and that's admirable. But I can see the argument that the pendulum was slung too far in the other direction with the near-religious adherence to its formulae. Gradually, they'd begin to tinker with the formula before going full force with the experiments in the psionic system, but that was too little too late. There were many great ideas during 4th edition's run, but far too many of them were locked behind the paywall of Dragon Magazine. Some of these were collected in the Dragon Dungeon Annual Sourcebook, such as Arena Fighting, but that was only done once. I think if some more of these Dragon entries ended up in Sourcebooks, albeit later than the initial Dragon postings, that might have helped matters. But instead, they wanted to focus on people signing up for D&D Insider, and that was a massive, massive mistake in my opinion. Now, while D&D is far from the only victim of this, it becomes more and more difficult to create challenging encounters the closer the party gets to the max level. Part of this is to be expected. It's hard to make something threatening when you're practically a demigod yourself. Now, while this can be addressed by having a campaign go full cosmic, that's a bandage, not a fix. I think the introduction of the Essentials line was the beginning of the end. On paper, making a version of the game specifically designed with newer players in mind doesn't seem like a bad idea. But the problem lay in the fact that they were effectively splitting the gameplay in two, not too far removed from the basic advanced deal that 3rd edition had previously unified. The irony is that Essentials was even more streamlined than before, and strangely put in a non-A4 format with its books that gave off the appearance of being bigger than they actually were. It was at this point that they started aping the advanced days, in my opinion, a tradition that sadly continues to this day. There's nothing wrong on paper with AD&D, mind you, but it's a case of tradition for tradition's sake that I absolutely loathe. Overall, 4th edition had a clear goal and was uncompromising in that goal, but in doing so it trampled on both real and imagined traditions resulting in a feedback loop that we saw through its run. It's not my intent to say the people who hate 4th edition are wrong, but merely to give some perspective. Overreactions do nobody any favors, and I think too many look at the game with hyperbole over everything else. If there's anything to take away from it, it's that traditions and nostalgia are, as I said in my first video, a sweet poison. As Hamlet said, better to bear ills that we have than fly to others we know not of. And speaking of flying, Next time we meet, we'll be discussing rolling dice in a galaxy far, far away. Hey there, thank you for watching if you managed to make it through all, all this way to the end. I realize it's been a while since I put up a video. I'm trying to maintain a two-week schedule to kind of give myself a rhythm. It'll be a while before I'm able to put up the next entry, but I hope you all look forward to it. In the meantime, if you enjoyed this, or you, th or you think I'm a heretic for saying these things about 4th edition, then let me know in the comments section below. Until then, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, STAY FUCKING FROSTY EVERYBODY!